All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And I should also say happy Black History Month. So I just wanna say what a beautiful day what a glorious crowd we have here today, and what a lovely occasion for us to gather and converse about the power and importance of black art. So we thank you all so much for coming out today. We're honored by your presence and the opportunity to host such an important event here at the Smithsonian Institution. My name is Jane Carpenter Rock, Deputy Director for Museum Content and Outreach here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm thrilled to welcome you and honored um, to have you and our guests here today for what promises to be a stimulating conversation about black art and the fascinating and impactful career of gallerist Mertiz Badola. Recently, our director, Stephanie Stiebisch, paid a visit to Mertiz at her gallery in Baltimore, where Mertiz told Stephanie about her tradition of gathering people together to discuss art over tea. These teas with Mertiz, as she called them, sounded lovely and Stephanie asked Mertiz if she would be willing to hold a similar event here at SAM. We are delighted she said yes, and then decided to gather together a group of world-class art experts to be her conversationalist today. Dr. Lowry Stokes Sims, Dr. Leslie King Hammond, Mel Hardy, and SAM director, Stephanie Stiebisch. While we have, oh, thank you, yes, put your hand. While we have lovely programs printed today with more extensive bios, I just wanted to take a moment to give you some background on our distinguished speakers. Mertiz Badola is the owner and founding director of Gallery Mertiz, a blue chip gallery and art advisory specializing in 20th and 21st century American art with a focus on works created by African American artists. She possesses over 30 years of experience as a curator, gallerist, and art consultant, lecturing, curating, and consulting all over the world. Joining the stage with her today will be legends in the scholarship and promotion of black art. Dr. Lowry Stokes Sims is an art historian and curator of modern and contemporary art, known for her expertise in the work of African, African American, Latinx, Native, and Asian American artists. She served on the curatorial staffs of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Museum of Art and Design. She has curated, lectured, and published extensively, both nationally and internationally. Dr. Leslie King Hammond is an artist, curator, and art historian, and the founding director of the Center for Race and Culture at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where she is also graduate dean emeritus. She serves on many boards, including the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. She has also curated, lectured, and published extensively, both nationally and internationally. Mr. Mel Hardy is a practitioner in the arts, culture, and humanities ecosystem here in Washington, D.C. A self-described creative class theoretician, Mr. Hardy chairs the Millennium Art Salon, an organization he co-founded with his dynamic wife, Juanita Hardy. He is currently an instructor at George Mason University's Carter School of Peace and Conflict Resolution and serves on the board of numerous art and culture institutions, including at the United Nations. Mel and his wife are avid art collectors and patrons. Our fearless leader, Stephanie Stiebisch, is the Margaret and Terry Stent Director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. In this role, she is responsible for the nation's premier collection of American art and its Renwick Gallery. Before arriving at the Smithsonian, she had been a museum director and arts practitioner for over 20 years. And finally, Valerie Cooper, has served as community outreach and diversity consultant here at SAM since 2022. She is a national project director for the HBCU Digital Art Project and consults on African and African American art for organizations across the country. And just taking a little moment of personal privilege, I would say that each of these panelists today have had a tremendous impact on my own career and on the field of African American art. So it's an honor to gather them together here today uh, I'd like to share that I first met Mel Hardy while I was a graduate student in art history at Howard University and working at Norman Parrish's Parish Gallery in Georgetown in the 1990s. It was during that time that I was also studying the work of Dr. Sims and Dr. King Hammond and just hearing about a dynamic up-and-coming gallerist named Mertiz Badola. 
So this is a wonderful cir full circle moment for me as well. Uh, this program would not have been possible without the tireless organizing efforts of our public programming team uh, led by Gloria Kenyon and our community outreach consultant Valerie Cooper and our audiovisual technician Willie Probst. So please join me in thanking them today. And finally, in honor of Black History Month, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the other SAM activities uh, that you might be interested in. Uh, first, we are opening in March an amazing new exhibition called Fighters for Freedom, William H. Johnson, Johnson, Picturing Justice. This will be opening very soon, and this gorgeous catalog will be on sale in our bookstore. Um, so I, please, I encourage you to come back and um, visit the museum when uh, Fighters for Freedom opens. It's going to be spectacular, and it has some um, pieces included in this version of the exhibition that came from Hampton University's Art Museum. Uh, and finally, we just launched an African American art audio guide, and you can find out more about it on our website. I encourage you to listen. So now, on this 25th day of Black History Month, Sam is pleased to host this meaningful conversation about the transformative power of black art. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mertice Badola and Sam director Stephanie Stebish. Here we are. I know, I love it. <laughs> Thanks for coming to our house. We can, uh, I, I know you have a lovely gallery. It might not be quite so big uh, to include all these wonderful guests we have here today. We're just thrilled to see you here today. And uh, if you don't mind, I uh, too want to uh, take a page out of Jane's wonderful introduction and thank you. I, um, I love the quote by Maya Angelou, which says, be present in all things and thankful for all things. So I invite you to be present because there are going to be some great voices and great conversations, some unpredictable, I'm sure, um, uh, uh, coming ahead too. And, uh, and Jane does a fabulous job here along with our super staff. And we've promised you tea. It's not just we're having tea here. We're actually having fake tea. You're having real <laughs> tea. So uh, just something to look forward to. Yes, and uh, Stephanie, I want to thank you for making this program possible. And I'd also like to extend a, my gratitude to Jane and Valerie, who have worked behind the scenes, along with your mighty team here, um, working diligently to you know, support the effort. So truly grateful for all that you've contributed to this event. Thank you. Oh, that, uh, our pleasure, our pleasure. So I think we should start. I know you have a lot of fans here, but it's always an interesting story, that origin story which is how did you ever come up with the idea of founding your own gallery in the wonderful charm city that is Baltimore? Uh, I have to confess, my mother uh, ran an art gallery too. It was her own art gallery in Lenox, Massachusetts. So I know how hard you work because I decided I didn't want to run the gallery. <laughs> I thought museum work might be a little easier. Uh, so talk a little bit about um, this incredible path of yours because you're practically a unicorn, there may be a dozen or so uh, black female-owned uh, galleries. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, um, I guess my earliest influences around art stem from my father, who was an art collector. I grew up in Chicago. I'm the oldest of three girls. And um, he and my mom are, well, my father is deceased now, but they were very creative individuals. My father was a professional jazz musician. He played the stand-up bass. Uh, my mother, the cello, and she loved to sketch. So that was my early, you know, um, experiences, visual experiences surrounding art. Also, being a Chicagoan, a city with great museums, I spent many hours uh, wandering the halls of the DeSavo Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Field Museum, um, the Museum of Science and Industry. I was a kid that was always lingering behind the group, um, reading the didactics, most of which I didn't understand, but I w just became immersed in the environment. So um, between that, that being my um, exposure to art in my home and original works of art, and then um, spending many hours in the museums, wandering around, looking, 
contemplating, examining, investigating in my own little head, um, I think that the outgrowth of that, those influences, uh, not necessarily what led me to the art, but what fostered my love and appreciation for it. I never saw being a gallerist, I never sought it as a profession. I never thought it possible. I never comp uh, contemplated it. I was going to be a CPA, so that was going to be my education. That was my journey. And then there was divine intervention. <laughs> Well, certainly accounting is useful in the gallery setting. Most definitely. <laughs> uh, um, I, I would offer to. And uh, again, I'm so happy you're here with us today. Uh, I think it's very hard to get on the uh, salon tea list in Baltimore. So, um, uh, But uh, coming today gives you a better shot to get on the list, I assure you. Uh, so uh, aside from uh, this accounting expertise that you bring to your, to your field, what is it that is so unique about galleries in general. I mean, you and I talk a lot about what the museum mm -hmm. world looks like, but it's a larger ecosystem. And museums simply can't exist without the important work that you do um, as a gallerist. And what does it mean today in your focus on black artists and being in that great city of uh, Baltimore? Yes, thank you for that. That's an important question. Um, I see my gallery and many others as the ecosystem that supports the museums, right? We find these wonderfully talented individuals uh, for my gallery. We kind of nurture them. We focus on artist development. And then I work in concert with many museum curators um, as an advocate for the artist, helping sometimes the, the curators understand the importance of the work that the artist is creating, uh, why it's culturally significant to my community and the world at large. And, um, and so that's, that's what I believe is part of my mission and what has helped the gallery grow and sustain itself. Um, also helping clients understand the importance beyond the aesthetic beauty of the art, why it's important perhaps to them culturally, um, you know, preserving our culture, living with art that represents um, their experiences, or if you're not African American, perhaps understanding the plight of others um, so that the art becomes um, a reflection of how we live as a community of just humans, <laughs> individuals navigating this earth. I'm gonna press you on that a little bit because I yes. think you have a secret sauce. There's something that you do very special uh, at your gallery. Could you tell us a little bit about it too? We have so many of your fans here. And, and in the ecosystem, I would remind you, collectors are so important because without collectors, you don't have artists, you don't have galleries. And then collectors, the smart ones, also go back and back to a gallery because a mm -hmm. gallery also, and a gallerist like you, you have an eye. So you can talk a little bit about that and what artists, you know, how artists speak to you and, and how you've kind of made your mark. Great, thank you. Um, well, if I consider the artists that I represent and why I have um, approached them or them coming to the gallery. Um, what I'm looking for are those who are able to create works that are compelling, that are telling their truth through a narrative that I believe is inspirational, um, one that is relatable, provocative at times, challenging uh, for me as an African-American racist tropes about my community and also, again, using it as a bridge to have conversations with individuals. It doesn't, doesn't exist, the black art doesn't exist solely for the purpose of validating black existence. It, it serves to validate our humanity. And that is where I want to connect to you and anyone else so that we look at the work, you know, our books are being banned, right? So here, that being the art, stands as a visual representation, uncensored about who we are. Our past, contesting the, um, 
injustices that we're presently facing and then giving us hope for the future. And it's that kind of a strong point of view which is really so attractive and so important. And as you and I have talked before, African-American art is part of American art. Absolutely. It is part of our shared, it's our universal history, uh, struggles, injustices, and then of course, uh, you know, bending uh, you know, bending towards a more positive future as well, too. And the visual arts are such a powerful medium. Uh, they, you know, you don't need a translation. I think we all come to it with our own experience as well, too. And I would also compliment you. You do a lot of public work, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you're not just sitting in the gallery waiting for somebody to come. You're always active. Uh, talk a little bit about art fairs and the things you do maybe outside of the gallery a little bit. Yes. So we don't solely exist in Baltimore, right? That's the geographic location where the building is. But beyond that, um, we participate in art fairs and museum exhibitions across the country and in 2022 in Venice. And we've also exhibited in, in Cuba. So knowing that uh, our presence beyond the gallery walls is critical for the exposure of the artist and making ourselves known in the art world. You know, there's this constant pursuit of visibility beyond where we exist. Uh, I could easily go on talking, but I know we have some exciting guests coming too, so I'm going to pass the, uh, the invitation speaking baton to you to invite some of our other guests out and to continue some of these interesting threads that we've just uh, started on. Yes, so I am super excited to invite to the stage Dr. Leslie King Hammond and Laurie Stokes Sims, who are both my mentors, and Mr. Mel Hardy. I love them. <laughs> There's really booze in here. <laughs> Mertis, we just uh, happen uh, to be starting by. Nice and close. Nice and close, okay. <laughs> so Matisse, we just happen to be stopping by and sort of that. Yes, sort of yes, program for tea. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was interesting listening to your or, um, origin story and what you look for in artists. But my question is, and this is something I get all the years I've been a curator, artists want to know how does <coughs> scholarship, historical records, um, financial savvy, how does this, all that sort of come together for you in your work as a gallerist? Yes, well, it's critical for me, which is why I'm so in love with you. Because <laughs> it is your scholarship that has helped to inform so much of what I do. So as a curator and gallerist, you know, I'm looking for to investigate blackness on the continuum of the histographies of the African American experience. So where do I find information to support that? I look to the scholars and primarily the writings of black scholars. So, um, you know, it's just, it's critical because often the experience, and that being one where people are engaging in black art. So there is my concept, my idea, my thematic approach. Mm -hmm. But for me, I believe that it has to be backed by scholarship. And, and so that's why I rely on individuals like you for most everything that I do, especially when I'm putting it out in the public realm. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to finance, financing, um, I I'll want to share something that has been critical in the evolution of Gallery Mertiz. So the Gallery Mertiz you experience today is not the one that was established in 06 in Washington, D.C. We moved to Baltimore in 08. And there were two critical points in my career that have influenced where I am today. One was my enrollment at MICA in the exhibition design seminar 
with George Sissel as my professor. A two-year program, the master's degree program, did not exist then. And uh, that's where I met Dr. King Hammond. Uh, George is a mentor to this day. The education that I received there um, helped me understand the importance of scholarship to put the work, how to put the work into historic context, socially, politically, uh, historically. And, and so that then became part of, I grew from the vision of what Gallery Mertiz should be to it having become a mission. And the mission was rooted in scholarship. Financing played a role because I believe it was 2015, my then tax accountant said, you know, I just finished the 10,000 small business program with Goldman Sachs, and you should enroll. And I got excited, I read all the information, and I applied. I made it, I think, to the third round. I mean, it's very intensive, just the vetting process. And I was rejected. I was rejected. <laughs> so, it was like a kick in the pants because I was so excited and I felt everything that I was looking at in terms of the outline, I wanted to become one of the cohorts. And, um, and they looked at my financial statement and they were like, oh no, you're not ready. You will not be invited in. So I had a long talk with Alex, my husband, and I was like, okay, I gotta do something different. So the first thing I did was, back to that education, this is what's going to lead Gallery Mertiz forward. No longer will the art simply be beautiful, um, art for art's sake, it had to be rooted in that scholarship. So I, the second thing I did was think about my experiences with my grandfather, who was an entrepreneur. And I would spend my summers with he and my grandmother in Aurora, Illinois. And uh, he owned a cleaning business and I would go with him during on my summer trips, stay in you know, my grandparents, and I would work alongside him, cleaning those office buildings, movie theaters, and my favorite was the candy store. And Grandpa would buy candy for me, that's how he paid me. But I, he would set up a table for me outside of the, his home, and I would sell the candy. So he was teaching me how to operate a business, right? And the milk carton was my cash register. The top of it, I put the dollar bills in, the part that cradled the coins is where I put my coins, you know, the eggs rather was where I put my coins. And so, pow, I was like, all right, I know, I had to go back to my roots. I know how to run a business. This is in me. I've got that, that entrepreneurial spirit is within me. So that led me to, okay, I, I've got, got to look at my roster. I've got to change this because this is my calling. I'm going to do this. So now, Gallery Mertiz has a financial advisor, CPA firm, you know, which, but I had to embrace the truth. Had I fought against that, I would not have been able to grow the gallery to where it is today. So the scholarship, buying, you know, uh, embracing your truth, the position of where you are, and then having the wherewithal and the intelligence, because my dad told me and my sisters that we were smart, and we tell our children that they're intelligent. So I knew I had the intelligence to do it. I just needed to draw from what I knew in order to move it forward. So in changing, making an assessment of those artists, I had to let a lot of them go. I put criteria in place. I now, I began to look for inspiration, what informs the work, Translation, can, can the artist translate those ideas and can they write about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Execution, can you execute that through your materials, what's your mastery of your materials? 
and then dedication. Don't come to me if you're a hobbyist, okay? I had a gentleman come to me one day and he was like, oh, Mertiz, I'm so happy to meet you. I've got a garage full of artwork. And my wife told me that I can't paint another thing until I get that junk out of the garage. I said, did somebody tell this brother that I was a drunk, a, a junk dealer? I was like, no. No, 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 this no. is a ma listen closely. This is a master class. Yes, this is a master so class. I this am, is this is really hard work. Yeah, so I am not a junk dealer. I am a gallery owner, and you're a hobbyist, and you stay away from me. So I didn't tell him in those terms. There was just no follow up. So sorry to belabor that and go on about that, but I'm very passionate about that. <laughs> no, I think that's a really important thing because you know even myself when. You know, all those years I spent at the Met, you know, like I was sitting there going, well, this is a really interesting artist. He, he had all the qualities that you had, but it's that kind of, I don't know, quality that, you know, each gallerist sees that allows them to think that they can promote the work and sort of get it out there into the market, which I think people need to understand. They think it's just a kind of organic situation. So this leads me to the... The, the most exciting project you've had, which was the Afrofuturist exhibit going to Italy. How was organizing that? I imagine you had to bring all those skills to that. But what was it like to organize that, coming from Baltimore and getting over to Venice? It was more than a notion. <laughs> was, which is really what cemented, I think, our bond. Because you've always been there for me. But it was after receiving the invitation and many sleepless nights before reaching out, I just felt so totally overwhelmed by the opportunity. I had never uh, curated an exhibition knowing what Venice is on that international platform, the historic significance of the Biennale, and having the opportunity to, and I didn't even know then that I was the inaugural uh, African-American gallerist mm -hmm. whose exhibition was being featured there. So without hesitation, after I contacted you, Laura, uh, Leslie and George Sissel, and also uh, Arthur Lewis, who's a very good client and an advisor, he, is, he has the UTA artist space in California. Um, the four of you were so critical um, p played such a critical role in the development of that exhibition. We were in the height of COVID, so all of our meetings took place via Zoom. You not only met with me, you advised the artist. I mean, Leslie, you came up with the concept, um, and that scholarship, you know, I read, I don't know, I don't know how many books on Afrofuturism that spurred this origin and in order to do the writings, there was a proposal that was requi required as well. So developing the concept, narrowing down the selection of the artists, which was, caused me great angst because I could not take everyone. Um, and then, you know, the, lo the logistics, um, getting the work there, my son, Noel, and uh, Kai, my assistant, I'm looking for them on the audience, you know, the, the number of hours that we spent dealing with art handlers and customs agents and Venice, it does not have any, you know, land vehicles. Everything comes in by boat. Mm -hmm. So that was an eye opener. Um, curating an exhibition with not having physically examined, uh, physically visited the space and um, designing an exhibition for 15th century Palazzo. I mean, it was just a thrill a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am always interested when we go beyond the borders of the safety, sacred zone of where we operate. As you moved out into this, and this is just because Laurie and I have just come from Portland, Oregon, and we saw a wonderful show of black artists at the Portland <clears throat> Art Museum. It was so much we didn't know. We hadn't realized that 
there were so many black artists, never mind there were so many black people. <laughs> <laughs> and we were reminded, because we were there, because we were celebrating an exhibition with Senga Ngudi and Marin Hassinger, who were in our 1988-89 Art as a Verb show, which is still alive and installed at MAMA with our names on a placard. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> who knew? And it was at that moment that we are talking with Senga and Marin, and I said, you know, there's all this black art. Oh, my God. And I said, who knew that there were that many black artists in Oregon? And Marin goes, stop. <laughs> she says, black people are everywhere. <laughs> so my question to you, and I don't know what your experience was, were you able to reach out to the Afro-Italian community there in all of the logistics that you had to deal with and all of the communities around the Venice experience of the Biennale? Yeah, so the vision when developing the exhibition mm -hmm. was to connect with the Afro-Italian community. Mm -hmm. I had designed, written, developed many programs where like Tony Chapman could interact with right. the Italian children because her work centers around black childhood. Uh, Delita Martin, who's a master printmaker, was going to have a workshop with uh, Italian women. Arvi Smith and Larry Cook, uh, their project was to work with incarcerated youth. <coughs> Little did I know that on, in Venice, there is not a community, per se, of Afro-Italians. We did have the support of a university that was miles away from where Venice is, who was willing to host us and support the effort. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that was not fully realized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was the most difficult aspect? for you in organizing this extravaganza yeah. <laughs> that came from Baltimore to Venice. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I think mm -mm. the most difficult things were the developing the concept, which you all were so helpful with, the logistics, uh, developing a, uh, or designing an exhibition from a foreign place, our host, which was the European Cultural Center, um, and we participated in the Personal Structures exhibition, um, Personal Structures, Time, Place, and Existence. So curating an exhibition for a international audience with in, in, in Venice during the Biennale, which has a very, look, short history of having exhibited the works by African Americans, I'm sorry. So I believe that Robert Colescott was the first. Um, uh, Mark Bradford may have been the second. And then in between was Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson, Mark Bradford, and then Simone Lee. Mm -hmm. So there's four. I mean, just to be specific, for the U.S. Pavilion. For I mean, the Sam U.S. Williams Pavilion. Sam Gilliam's work was you know, prominently. Correct. I mean, there are other venues, yeah. but the U.S. Yes. Pavilion being yes. that marker for the United States. So in the history of the Biennale, which I believe was established in 1895, mm -hmm. there have only been four in the U.S. Pavilion. So um, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so I wanted the exhibition in presenting the works to be ones collectively, um, those that were centered around an authentic voice of blackness, I sought to achieve three goals. One, to recontextualize the black experience through a futurist lens, with Afrofuturism being the framework. Two, to present works um, that investigated the social political concerns of the African American community. And then lastly, to celebrate, celebrate black culture and the creativity, spirituality, and resiliency that has historically sustained black people. 
Well, that brings me to this point, and it right. brings me back to you. Yes. How has this impacted upon your perception of self as a gallerist of import now that you are on this international platform? Wow. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the art world, she's fickle. So, um, but it is my hope that I will be perceived as one who is an individual who strives for excellence, um, ethical, and professional. Um, I appreciate the response to the exhibition and the fact that it has elevated the presence of the artist, who I believe have benefited greatly from it. And also, I know part of my being here and other opportunities that have come forth are as a result of the exhibition being in Venice. We were able to bring it to Baltimore, which was really extremely important to me, because knowing that many in my community would not be able to travel to Venice to experience it there. So I am grateful to you, Leslie, for helping to facilitate that. It was shown at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. Um, so I'm thankful to Terry Freeman for for that, and then Dr. Schroeder Cherry, who allowed it to be um, installed at the uh, James E. Lewis Museum on the campus of Morgan State University. That was a very important moment for the community of Baltimore to realize that we had a life and a presence and an impact uh, on, a, on an international level at a major venue to which not many, if any, um, African-American galleries have ever had the opportunity to be part of that mega experience. So we were immensely proud of you. We were celebrating you. And it was wonderful when the works came back to see them in these two sites, at an HBCU and then also at the uh, Reginald Lewis Museum. Uh, these artists who now are seen and heard and interacted with the Italian community. So I, bravo. Yeah, thank you. So Matisse, we have a little salon here going on. Mm -hmm. We're going to meet here alternate Thursdays. Um, <laughs> <laughs> keep an eye out. And I know Mel, who's with his wife Juanita, uh, the forces behind Millennium Salon here, mm -hmm. wanted to talk to you about your salon experiences. Yes. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> and um, since we are having tea with Matisse, uh, we have to note that here in D.C., Mertice got her start here in D.C. It's actually, you talked about the gallery, I think, mm -hmm. having started in 2006, but really you were associated with the art scene in Washington long before that. So it's uh, really uh, uh, greatly appreciated uh, your presence here of longstanding. Uh, you've abandoned D.C. to go to Baltimore. <laughs> but... Um, uh, but but it, it's all good. We're all in the same greater Washington area. And in that, uh, Washington has a very special place uh, in the pantheon of the, uh, of the arts. Uh, both historically, this is a museum uh, that can chronicle and, and document all of the movements in art um, uh, just a, a great breadth. It's part of the Smithsonian Institution, but on a con in contemporary work, um, you're representing uh, Amy Sherald, whose work is here. Uh, she painted uh, one of the destination paintings of uh, Miss uh, Miss Obama uh, here in in, this, in these walls, and so we uh, have a debt of gratitude for the touches that you have made um, in, in art here in, in the company of these uh, very uh, beautiful women on this stage. I would say with regard to the salon, I represent um, uh, two things. One, I'm a member of the uh, director's circle here at SAM, in which I hold uh, 
great uh, honor. Uh, I'm just delighted to be associated with that, with, with Juanita. And then the other is Millennium Arts Salon. And we at the salon, if we can, uh, Gloria, if you can cue up the first uh, slide here that looks at the origins of the salon. It has a major uh, history um, that goes back for uh, many, many uh, centuries. We start, or at least in my writing, I start with the Greek and the uh, architecture of the home, the Androne for men and the gymnasium for women, in which you discuss the matters of the day. Uh, talk about the exploits of uh, you know the, the participants and uh, you know cultural and political affairs of the day. If we fast forward, you know, through Italy in the 16th century and then uh, into the 18th and 19th century, I'd like to spotlight. Uh, what Elizabeth McHenry would have written about in 2002, Forgotten Readers, the History of African American Literary Societies. When you think about that as a salon in which the salon engages people to understand where they are in their societies and that quest for learning, which is what the salon does. And we at uh, Millennium Arts Salon have a dual role of advancing cultural literacy through the arts, but also as a nonprofit organization which is not transactional, our focus was to uh, connect collectors with artists. And so in so doing, we as a small nonprofit here in, in this city, uh, we are also part of that ecosystem uh, of the arts, culture, and humanities, and in that we are, we express a great deal of pride. And I wish Juanita here was here. She's a thought leader. She's actually over at National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, also presenting around collecting there. So, um, so Matisse, um, what Mel talks about raises a question. Your tease with Matisse. How does? that kind of salon activity intersect with the business of running the gallery and promoting the artists and cultivating collectors? Well, the inception of my tea with Mertiz comes from a very personal place. My grandmother and I would have tea together and conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And during those moments, she would share fragments of her life and offer words pearls of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So Alex and I were ha having on a stroll one afternoon and it was after, I think the day after we had had a opening at the gallery and a woman had and I had a conversation which she shared with me that her visit to my gallery was the first gallery she had ever visited. And she was in her probably in her 60s, this was more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And she shared that she had always believed that <coughs> the gallery was not for her, those experiences. Felt very intimidated by coming, but visited that day. Um, she was invited by a friend, so she came with her friend. And she said, this, this environment just feels very foreign to me, but I'm so happy that I'm here. And I don't know anything about art, you know, I have, you know, art on my walls, but I just kind of buy things mm -hmm. just to, so I don't, I'm not living in a white space. And I thought, wow, art has enriched my life in so many ways. I mean, I look around this room and there's so many familiar faces and art is the thread that connects us. And I thought, well, what can I do then to enrich her experience? So she just doesn't come to an opening where there's a lot of chatter and people are excited, but create an experience that's far more enriching mm -hmm. and to educate without educating. Mm -hmm. And the tea was born. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. wow, you know, my grandmother and I had these wonderful intimate conversations and I would like to create an environment where we can have that kind of exchange, but 
art will be the center of those conversations. So um, I began to develop programming because I was taught at MICA the importance of community engagement and programming. And I put artists on the panel, curators, museum curators, directors, authors, scholars, um, arts professionals, lawyers, appraisers, all of these individuals have sat <coughs> around the table and had intimate conversations with the curious. And that woman came back, to, she was at our first tea and attended several thereafter and brought her grandson which absolutely warmed my heart, young teenager. That kid asked the most important questions <laughs> around the table. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yes, I've hit gold. That's what we want. That's, that was the level of engagement that I sought. Mm -hmm. and, and it just, they're very popular. Um, and I'm very proud of having established them. Uh, can I interrupt, just interrupt, just a and second. And then me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, as you talked about your teas, you've done your teas both at the gallery and other places. <clears throat> and there was one of the postcards that you might have seen for Millennium Art Salon up there. And one of our early salons was with Dr. King Hammond here. So the idea of engaging mm -hmm. uh, in this pursuit of understanding, uh, developing a sense of self that each individual in your audience can develop because of your agency in catalyzing that sense of self is so important for us in the salon business, and we are having a salon here today in this building. So mm -hmm. I'm so appreciative. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mel. Mm -hmm. May I? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> you know I have to still live with her. <laughs> One thing that I think needs to be brought out is that, and, and Mertice mentioned it early on and in your introductions, talked about your need to educate yourself and prepare yourself. And I have to give you total props because you came into Micah's exhibition practice, which is now a master's degree in curatorial practice. And upon the survey of the most distinguished Dr. Sims, <laughs> uh, looking at all of the programs in the United States that attest to this kind of education, Micah has one of the strongest programs that literally teaches how to do curatorial practice, respecting the voice of the community and respecting the voice of the artist. And because Mertice came through at a time when it was not a degree granting institution, this last commencement cycle, she was given an honorary doctorate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> I, I've got a quick, quick question, quick point, which is the sense of time, right? Sometimes we talk about museum time and gallery time. Yes. Okay? Uh, and we're not so fast in the museum sector. We've got a lot of people um, uh, and, and a long gestation period. And, and again, I, I really admire the nimbleness uh, with which you operate. Uh, I'd just love you to talk a little bit about your understanding the long arc, that the time that is required. So again, you talked about 2006, more or less, your gallery. Um, my mother's gallery, I, I don't know if we talked about, it. anyway, she was, uh, her specialty was Haitian art. She I mean, did the first, most important Haitian exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum in 1978. Wow. wow. <laughs> um, uh, I, I was 12 years old and I gave my first gallery tour. Um, and look what happened to me. So, uh, and now Haitian art is on the walls of the Museum of Modern Art. So what a long span. I've, I've known this great woman for a long time too. So talk about having to have this long view, this perspective, keeping on and keeping on with this really deep belief in what you are doing and the artists that you're representing. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Well, it, I guess it comes from a place of knowing, of certainty and determination. Um, this is what I was born to do. Mm-hmm. And once I gave mm-hmm. over to that, I knew that there was no going back. Even when there was a time where you know, I got that rejection and I had, I was like, do I have to go and get a job? I mean, really, I mean, I was questioning whether or not this was meant for me, but there was a, you know, I, like I tell my sons, okay, you get 30 seconds for the pity party, right? And then we have to move on because if you stay stuck in that, you're going to miss what's intended for you, right? So we, and I literally said, okay, now, what is it that we need to do to move this forward? And that's the assessment that I made. So it is hard work, it's strategic, Mm -hmm. it's um, study, it's disciplined, it's positioning my gallery and my artists to be sought after. That's one of my mantras. Mm -hmm. Like what do I need to do different from my colleagues that will make gallery Mertiz sought after. Mm -hmm. And what it really comes down to is excellence. Mm -hmm. Striving for excellence, not perfection, Mm -hmm. but excellence Mm -hmm. in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And treating everyone that comes into my gallery space, everyone that we interact with, with respect. Mm -hmm. Whether they're able to buy or not. Mm -hmm. No one should leave my space having a bad experience. It is the culture of the gallery. It is our mantra. Absolutely. It is totally, totally understood. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean to the point where mm-hmm. I've had a homeless woman come to my gallery one day. Her name is Mary. We know her, Mary. We know her name. And she comes in and she will sit because she wants to be surrounded by beauty. And she has a car. She lives in her car. And she came in one day and she was crying because she said she had visited another gallery who she knew they saw her at the door, but they totally ignored her and would not let her in. And so she was shaken when she came into my gallery and she thanked me for treating her with respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I knew then that she was homeless and she had visited the gallery several times, Mm -hmm. but I hugged her that day and I haven't seen her in the space in a while, so I am a little concerned about her but she is just an absolutely lovely person. And she said, being here reconnects me on a very human level in a way that I'm, I'm not able to do in other spaces. Right. Right. So, you know, I know what that is. Yes. I know we have to start closing up, but Stephanie, I'd love for you to sort of talk about your experience working in museums and how you see the relationship between museums and galleries. I sort of say that question because I once, in my inimitable way, double booked myself with a private gallerist and a curator from another museum in New York. And I said, well, why don't we just all have lunch together? The curator from the other museum sort of said, lunch, um, do you think that you know, we'll be compromised? Mm. I said, by having lunch with a gallerist? I said, for me, I need a diamond necklace, a fur coat, and a Ferrari <laughs> to be compromised by myself. Lunch at her house, which will probably be soup and a sandwich. Nah. <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how, how do you, because there's always this kind of question, you know, about museums. and I mean, galleries are pissed off because we take so long to pay and, you know, things like that. And, but but we, 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 it's a really important part of what we do. Yes, yes. I, I think in the museum field, sometimes we have this holier attitude that galleries deal, deal in the commercial realm, yes. Yes. God forbid. Yes. So truth be told, uh, I was not very good at uh, being at my mother's gallery uh, to, to watch the gallery because I didn't really want to sell anything. So I thought museums are for me. <laughs> Um, because it's, it's hard work, right? And, and it, uh, you, you have to make this connection, you have, to, you have to tell this greater story. In the museum, in, in the art world sector, there used to be a very fine line. You were either on the gallery side or you're at the museum side. I happily think that there's a lot more room now, 
a little bit more going back and, and forth because we're all in it together. Uh, again, I, I said that museums are slow. That's not necessarily a criticism. I mean, we have research, we have a lot of things, you know, just it's a larger organization more to move. Uh, and again, there's the nimbleness of galleries. And you are kind of the incubators. You, it's the startups. Uh, you have to make that early commitment until museums catch up, until the, whatever, the market has spoken, there are enough galleries uh, out there, there are enough uh, collectors. Uh, and, and again, what I think is so important about galleries is it is the eye of the gallerist. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who say, oh, no, I, I bought a lot of things that, you know, Leo Castelli or this or that. And it's a bit of a mark, right? You know kind of what they're, what they're interested in. And when I meet people, I say, well, where did you, you know, you're a collector? Is there any particular gallery? It's a little bit of a question. You know, where, where do you buy things? Um, are they speculators, buying things at auction or charity auctions or whatnot? I, I don't know if I answered your question well no, I think enough. That, yeah. um, but I have the utmost respect for the hard work that you do. And it's so important uh, because if you're not supporting these artists early on, and you need to make a very important decision, which is, are these artists going to go the distance? Are they truly, truly committed? And we know that, uh, that also you support artists, so you buy work from the artists yourselves, you hold on to things when you're able. Um, and again, it's, it's a very important um, uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I don't think we should be afraid of, of dealers. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, uh, uh, they, they are important, um, you know, a kind of imp important starting position for so much that happens in the, in the museum sector. And I'm always saddened when a gallery closes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the ecosystem yeah. has changed so much where yeah. I don't even know how often you're in Baltimore because there's an art fair here and there's an art fair there. Right. And, then, and art fairs are great because you see a lot of galleries in kind of one cadence. I'm going to uh, freeze LA next week. And they said, oh, we only have 90 booths this year. We're down 20%. I thought, oi, oi, oi. Um, <laughs> Got to put on my comfortable shoes. Yeah. Uh, but that's a lot of work, too, packing things up, trying to figure right. out art fair. Right. But it's something very special to be in a gallery space, see the environment that you are creating and, and, the, um, and the following that you have. Yeah. So and hats and off. Stephanie, if, if I might add, I, I think there's also a place for other intermediaries that educate people around mm -hmm. the fine arts, uh, if you will. And so um, we collectors uh, really need this engagement with you professionals that are mm -hmm. in the business in a different way. I think we've all used the word education, whether it's formal education, the great work at MICA, uh, the education that museums do, the education that a salon does. Again, you know, birds of a feather, they're sort of flocking together. And again, galleries also play an important educational role too. And again, that early word scholarship and research, it is based on this foundation as well. And gallery catalogs and announcements are also great collectibles. <laughs> keep, keep, keep those together because uh, archives will want that in the future. If I may jump in, um, because this conversation is incredibly robust, and <laughs> I, uh, but we would like to hear from everyone in the audience and those of you joining us online. If you're here in the um, auditorium, you have a comment card. If you're online, you can pop a comment in the chat box. We would really be interested to hear some of your questions about things today and what you've heard. Ask this amazing panel of folks things. And I would like to invite up Valerie Cooper to moderate the Q&A for us. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you very much for that, Gloria. And oh my goodness, what an amazing, robust discussion that we've heard so far. Let's give this wonderful panel a round of applause. I think we can take this on the road. Where's, where's our next yeah. stop? Uh, I, I think this tea with Martise concept, we may need a little van here to have stops along. I, I hear there's a state fair initiative, state fair initiative. Maybe we'll have tea at the state fairs as we travel across the country, but as you're thinking of your questions um, and passing your cards to Gloria, and also if you're online, please uh, drop your questions somehow in the chat and we'll try to pick them up. I want to just encourage you, you're here today, you're here at SAM, and when this is over, the museum is open until 7 tonight, please don't leave. We have a phenomenal array of exhibitions, um, including Carrie Mae. Weems, uh, looking forward, looking back. We have Alma Thomas here. She's a Washingtonian. 
uh, HBCU graduate, first one from the Art Department of Howard. Um, <laughs> it goes on and on. We have a phenomenal photography exhibition of J.P. Ball, juxtaposed with uh, Robert Duncanson, who's a landscape painter. If you don't know, now you know, right? <laughs> and so make your way through the museum. It is a shared space with the National Portrait Gallery and the latest Portrait of Oprah is here on display, Beyonce, the Obamas, and I could go on and on, giving you guys a chance to write some questions. So, um, but also doing a little bit of community outreach marketing for this phenomenal institution called the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the very first museum of the Smithsonian's 21. So please stay. Um, the courtyard is in the middle. There's a phenomenal cafe. You can get a glass of wine, have a sandwich and the gift shop. Let me show you <laughs> what we have. I, I was not paid to do this, but all the guests, we're not gonna call them up in the interest of time, but they are gonna leave today with the wonderful Alma Thomas scarf. <laughs> Similar to mine, you can find this in the gift shop. It's not exactly a car, you know, like an <laughs> Oprah. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Simms. And um, Jane mentioned we have William H. Johnson Fighters for Freedom exhibition that's Making its way, it's traveling right now, but it stops at Sam next uh, March 8th, which is two Fridays from now, and it opens, and it's going to open with a bang. So the gifts will get a magnet as a teaser to hopefully entice them to please come back. And um, we also want you all to come back on March 10th as we celebrate Women's History Month in the courtyard, along with William H. Johnson and others. So it looks like I now have some questions, and I'm going to move to the first. All right, how much time do we have, Gloria? Please keep me on time. All right, so the first question is um, from our online audience, and it, it has to do with, Martise, your recognition in the New York Times, and what it felt like when you were contacted by the newspaper to be interviewed for, it sounds like there may have been two groundbreaking articles. Can you talk a little bit about that level of fame? Okay. <laughs> well, it felt great. <laughs> <laughs> so the first article um, was written by Robin Pogrindon. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. And it focused on the inequities in the art world. Um, it occurred in June 2020, and she focused on, uh, or drew attention to the fact that, um, you know, there was a viewing room because of COVID. Um, that w the viewing room was put into place. Um, as an alternative to visiting the art fairs, and this was the Basel Fair. Out of the 281 galleries that were featured, not one was black owned. Mm -hmm. So she addressed mm -hmm. the systemic racism in the art world, um, the barriers that have deliberately put in place mm -hmm. that prevent black owned galleries for participating in art fairs, becoming members of professional arts organizations. All of these things impact our ability to sustain and grow our businesses. Those art fairs draw museum curators, major art collectors, and art dealers to those venues. And that is where the deals are made and um, for the major artworks. So that was the first article. And she interviewed several black-owned galleries. I was the one that was above the fold, it was in print. So that was really cool. And then the second one was focused on my partnership with Christie's, which was unprecedented. I have been operating in the, I'm the one that's always behind the scenes um, in, the art, in the auction world. I have consigned many important and historic works at auction, primarily with Swan and Alma Thomas, uh, Nelson Stevens, uh, David Hammonds, and David Driscoll, um, and many others. But those are the primary, the most significant works. 
And so, as a result of my relationship with auction houses over the years, Christy being one of them, I approached them about partnering with them to consign works created by the artists who were featured in the Biennale. Um, immediately, they accepted, and so that was another unprecedented event. Excellent. Let's give her a round of applause for that recognition. What an excellent question that was. Um, here's one that um, is very organic. Is Rashida in the audience? Rashida, stand up if you're here. Uh, good afternoon. My <laughs> name is Rashida, and I am an art historian and a curator. Thank you for all the trails that you have blazed. I am because you are. Ooh, I <laughs> what advice do you have for the next generation of culture caretakers? And I love that. Let's say it again. Culture caretakers. Okay. She needs some I questions. love that term. We are playing a role in the cultural preservation, right? And it is a role that I take very seriously. Um, you know, we have a history of being erased from the textbooks, from scholarship. And again, with books being banned that speak our truth, we look to the arts for those visual representations of who we are. And taking a role in through education, scholarship, uh, writing about the work, because it evolved, we're on the continuum, right? And so while our experiences are shared, I don't know how to convert that into TikTok or Instagram or anything like that. Where's Kai Vassar? That's Kai's role at the gallery. <laughs> so I, you know, I need younger people to interpret, mm -hmm. translate, communicate those things. And, and I seek the generation before me to help move me forward. And now it is your turn to come and do the same. So, um, you know, it's, it's important work. It is really important work. And I applaud you for taking that on. And the thank you for that. Yeah, if I can. Uh, <clears throat> I can just um, add a little codicil to that. <clears throat> if the goal in our American society is to um, um, be about the business of the embrace of all of its citizenry across the ethnocultural ability spectrum, then it is important for cultural caretakers to be lifted more highly than we are now. In this house, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, its name suggests the advance of pluralism for America. And so uh, gathering in, in, in events like this is so vitally important. Uh, th thank you, Mel. And also ask, I was speaking earlier with Professor Alan uh, Wallach, and we're both Columbia University uh, grads. We talked about how they didn't teach American art in the day. So, I mean, we, we still have a lot of catching up <laughs> just to get the American art out there in the bigger story, too. And, and I, I love that term, too. I love the term, too, keepers of collections. And I would say, um, if you're an up-and-coming young curator as well, be a bit of a detective. Be a bit of a historian. There are people who are sitting on wonderful art. Those are family descendants. You know, a lot of women artists, they, they chose not to have children. Their artwork may be lost unless there are relatives who held on to things. Again, at the Harlem Renaissance exhibition opening at the Met, an exhibition I really implore you to see. It's fabulous. Uh, and Sam is a big lender, over 10. We're the largest institutional lender with, with 10 works in the show. Uh, obviously, there were institutional lenders, HBCU. Um, university collections were well represented, and then families. Families who have held on for generations for artists who were overlooked, underrepresented, underrepresented you know, forgotten, or, or again, written out, or you know, purposely omitted. 
And those families had real grit and real belief. And so, uh, not the hobbyists per se, but uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll know what that looks like. So there are a lot of artists still to be uh, brought into the larger story of, of American art and black art. You know, this is, this is something I have to go back to. And this goes to the fault lines in the history and the canon of our um, American art history and the culture and the legacy and the character of what this nation is all about. There is so much of culture that is hidden in plain view. Mm -hmm. We are just beginning to even accept the aspects of material culture, which is that material culture, teacups, these things that Mertice is dealing with. You, there are so many young people out here who we are passing the baton on to. There are areas of research that have been completely blindsided and have to be addressed. The archives are vacant. There is no information. So if you don't pick it up, if you don't begin to pay attention to what is hidden in plain view, the things that you know, we could hold on to, that we did have access to, are those things that tell the story about how we survive and why you all are sitting here today trying to learn what are the next steps. Because Martise has sort of laid the groundwork and shown you, yes, this is a can-do. This is a real possibility. And we need more of you. Why is she the only serious, gallerous, African-American being recognized right now. We need more of you everywhere, anywhere. Collaborate, come together, figure it out. But please, don't stop. Don't leave here without moving on that inspiration that brought you here. Here, here. here, here, here. So I'd like to also on that note, um, pay tribute to some women whose shoulders that we stand on. I, like Martise, had a gallery many, many years ago um, and pursued a career in the corporate art world. But I think, you know, women like June Kelly, women like Essie Green, women mm -hmm. like Peg Alston, mm -hmm. uh, Stella mm -hmm. Jones, um, I watched them as I was growing up in the art world, wanting to be like them as I grew up. Women like Nadia Fatah, mm -hmm. who was a mentor that introduced me to Mel, and she told me I needed to know who Lowry and Leslie were. She would drag me to their talks in Art Basel. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who I was, but I watched them over the years, and they have become our art queens um, in this space. And I just want to say thank you for paving the road for myself, for Mertise, Alva Beander. I ended up being an appraiser because of Alva. And Betty Krulik, who's my mentor and on this call right now, um, has been instrumental in my career. Not African American, but no doubt uh, a woman mentor in this space. So I would be remiss if I didn't think, thank Stephanie and Jane, because why am I here? It's because they too believe strongly in preservation of the African-American culture. Mm -hmm. Stephanie learned about my dining room table project where I, as a STEM child and graduate of Morgan State, was determined to digitize every HBCUR collection in this country. Not all works, but the top 100. I was a Wall Street girl, so you know, the Dow top 100 made sense. <laughs> and she tells me not to use Wall Street terms in, in the museum world, okay. Uh, so we did a deal, which, you know, I can't quite call it that, but we figured, she heard about the project, happened to be at the reopening of Howard's Gallery right after the pandemic, and she asked me how we could potentially partner to, to bring that dream I had to fruition. She didn't know how it was going to happen, neither did I. But fast forward, and I'm here, she's surrounding me with her resources, Jane's incredible to work for, and as she mentioned, if it wasn't for the HBCU art collections, there would be no Met Harlem Renaissance show. And Sam is one of the largest lenders as well, so thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Jane. This is an opportunity for me to say thank you for having me here. And I wanna just thank you all. We now have too many questions that I can actually get through, but I'd like to ask each panelist as we close, 
you know, that dining room table project for me, something was, <laughs> something strange happened when I turned 60. I started thinking about like, what am I gonna leave behind when I'm no longer here? And it's that HBCU digital art collection project because I think that not the HBCUs that we really know, but those little tiny ones we don't really know so well. I am willing to bet that the richness of their art, their archives is gonna be incredibly phenomenal once it's all available and a part of the American art canon. So that is gonna be my contribution, but I'd like each of the panelists to just say a few words, a minute or so, about when it's all over, said and done for each of you, what do you, Martise, Mel, Larry, Leslie, and Stephanie in that order, want to be remembered for in terms of your contribution to the American art canon? Martise. Wow, that's a great question. Well, I think that part of it may have been reflected in the images that were looping as we were talking this afternoon, one of which was a portrait that um, Amy Sherald painted, Rondon Queenie. And I asked Amy's permission to include that image because I sold that piece to the Museum of African American History and Culture, the Smithsonian. And it is one of many that I've been able to place in museum collections. So that is part of my legacy that I'm living now and I'm really proud of, knowing that that piece and many others um, that I've placed in museum collections so that when black children walk the halls of the museums, they can experience those images images, see themselves in it, ask questions about them. Um, so that's part of what I'm proud of. I'm also proud to have my son, Noel, working for me in the gallery. Um, the impact that the gallery is having on the arts, the economic empowerment that is resulting from that for my family and the families of the artists that I represent, those are also things that I'm very proud of. I also hope to establish a nonprofit organization where I'm able to give back. And the focus of that effort is for curators. So I'm not quite ready to reveal the whole vision yet, still in the works, but uh, that's part of the contribution I hope to make. All right, so stay tuned for that one. Mr. Hardy, what can we expect in terms of your legacy? So Millennium Art Salon celebrates uh, 25 years next year, and the focus will be on our archives uh, from that point. So uh, over 25 years, we have interviewed many, many people across the, um, the range of the arts, culture, humanities, opera singers, authors, much the same that we've heard here tonight. So uh, I hope I speak for Juanita as well, that uh, what we might leave behind is uh, the first uh, quarter of the 21st century, we will have had impact on primary source material coming from a, um, a labor of love organization uh, that um, uh, surveyed and presented uh, so many of the, um, the influence centers of American culture through the archives that we might leave behind. Excellent. Thank you for that contribution. <laughs> That's a hard one. I think that I would like to be remembered as the person who just went for it. Um, when I got the job at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I had left, said I was leaving Johns Hopkins to go get a job. I, I knew I wanted to work in museums because I had worked at the Br Br Brooklyn Museum and I had bogarted my way into the old Museum of African Art as an intern. And I didn't know how to do it. In 1972, everybody told me ignore New York. So I sent out my resume to museums in the area 
and uh, then showed up in my best dress and white gloves. That's how old it is. And people came out and went, I didn't know that, you know, black people didn't do this in museums. And when I got to the National Gallery, the whole department came out and looked at me. <laughs> and then Margaret Bolton said to me, um, I think I got a job for you. Go back to New York. Take the GSA, which I thought was going to be a disaster because I barely did okay with the SAT test. And because I had two languages, they put they bumped me up to the line, and I had a job. My first um, <clears throat> assignment was supposed to be a lunchtime lecture on a Manet painting for some Supreme Court judges. I might have been silly to sort of give that up, but the Met called. And the Met calls because I applied for a job that my best friend, Philip Rienowen, didn't give me, and that's why I have a fabulous cut career today. So I gave up that job to the dismay of my father and mother and went for it at the Met, and I got that job. And all the times I was in the Met, I just went for it. You know, when I couldn't do shows and I knew I wasn't going to get shows, I just went for it because when I was in community programs, I had established relationships with our, our people um, all over the city of New York and they got to be national. I just went for it, went to every conference. When I finally um, got, finished my degree, was full curator, I went for it again and became the director of the Studio Museum. And people, I, I was like 50 years old, people said, why are you doing that? You're gonna ruin your, <laughs> your pension and the whole thing. And then after about five years, I knew that was time and I went for it again and I said, okay, that's it. Um, I'm gonna do something else. I was 58 years of age and I got a job at the Museum of Arts and Design. So I, and I, did that until, you know, 66, I wanted my social security and my pension. And since then, over the last 10 years, I've just gone for it, you know, like for projects that mean a lot for me. Going for it also meant that I had fantastic fellow travelers and Leslie King Hammond in particular. We've known each other since Girl Scouts. We were an undergraduate together. We were graduate school together. When I got the job at the Met, she got the job at, at uh, Maryland, Micah. And we, I swear to God, in the, in the 1970s and 80s, we should have had stock in AT&T. We called each other every single night. Okay, so, okay, so what did your white people do today? So, <laughs> so. So, I want to be remembered, I went for it, and I had great friends doing it with me. <laughs> well, all righty then. Okay, Dr. Hammond. She would always say, <laughs> she hates to follow me. No, I hate to follow her. <laughs> um, Come on, Leslie, you burst the entire art world. I understand that. However... <laughs> Whatever you perceive me to be as I sit here was not ever on my life plan. So what, one, I want you to remember this about me is that I chose the serendipitous path to follow my passion, which was the arts. My family thought I was cuckoo. Um, I didn't care because I knew here where the compelling things in my life motivated me and what I could trust. If you don't, and, and as a result of that, as I fell through windows of opportunities, forward, backward, upside down, inside out, I would say, oh, let's see where this goes because I was curious, and the only reason I got a PhD was because I'm nosy, I'm just a nosy bitch. <laughs> and I figured that a colored girl needed credentials to be able to get into people's business <laughs> the way I was getting into people's business, not knowing where that business would take me, 
you understand, I had to have some validation. So that was the only literal thing. But that too was serendipitous to a large degree. So what I did with that serendipity was I was strategic, I would leverage it. Do you understand? I would figure out what could it do for me, but more importantly, and this is the second point I want my legacy to be remembered for, was that how could I, it help me become a way maker for other people? Do you understand? That if somebody was stupid enough to let me at that door, <laughs> to let me in, how many other people could I get through? So, <clears throat> being at MICA and being with Lowry and being blessed with um, uh, a huge opportunity with Ford and Philip Morris, I was able to birth, and just my very presence of being an anomaly at the Maryland Institute College of Art, being a dean back there in the 70s. Who ever heard of black woman, you know, graduate school, Beaux-Arts, 1826, Micah, one of the first in the nation. You know, I said, hmm, you know, and <clears throat> so I was able to birth, you know, like Sonia Clark and Dawood Bay and, and, and Nick Cave and, and Peter Williams and you name it, I can go down. Amy Sherrill was one of mine, okay? She came and, and after I left Micah, I fell into a fellowship to help create maker spaces in Baltimore and Amy became one of, after she graduated from Micah, she became one of the artists, so I watched. Michelle Obama's painting, mm -hmm. ah. stroke by stroke being done. So a way maker, you understand, which anybody can become. Anybody can be a way maker. You know, you just put your elbow in the door or toe, whatever. <laughs> Make it happen. Make it happen while they're not looking. You understand? Make it happen. All right? This is my, what I call, can-do philosophy. You can do something, okay? And the other thing, Laurie and I, we didn't ever look for credit for what we did. Do you understand? We, we was didn't too, ask permission. Didn't, oh yeah, no permission. What did you call it, crimes of opportunity? <laughs> we loved it. Besides, what do the white people do to you today? We would say, what crime of opportunity did you get over? today, okay? Because you know, when you're living in a hostile, racist society, you gotta have some fun somewhere. So you wanna know how many white men did you piss off today? You know, I mean. But the other thing, because my family always knew I was a wing nut in the family, you know, they'd always say, where's Leslie Ann? She's off the Richter scale somewhere. Um, is that I really want to get my archives and my biography in order so that this story can be known how to do it because this is part of the fault lines of American art and art history and the legacy of our heritage. And I want to tie that into doing the biography on my family who migrated out of the Caribbean my great-grandmother, and that's where I got this weird ass hair from, was a Brit, okay? I thought she was like a Creole. And my grandfather said, my, my uncle said, no, she was a British woman. I went, like, oh my God. <laughs> Who married my grandfather, okay? My great-grandfather, who was charcoal, indigo, black, Congo. And I went, whoa, what was that about? That's the story I need to get to, okay? Because the family needs to know it because now I'm the matriarch in my family, which I'm having a hard time dealing with, okay? And I've got a gaggle, a gaggle of nine nieces and nephews, grandnieces and nephews who are all doodle bugs. They are makers and they are busy and they are mouthy and they're like, you know, I get these, em these, these videos from my family and they say do you see anything similar about this and of course they're talking about my wonky weird wild personality so I got to t you know pull the whole circle together now to show 
how a life in the arts and culture is so damn viable and why we do what we do because we just love it. We are junkies for the arts. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And Stephanie, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to come and stand over here with me. This is the head of the house here at Sam, and you're having the final say. And if you can come over and just stand and face this audience as you close this out in your own way and share your legacy and what you'd like to live, leave here behind, I want to give you that opportunity. Well, I'd really like to summarize. I mean, I think we heard passion. I think we heard boldness. I think we heard ambition. Nothing wrong with ambition. And let's remember the word excellence. This is about excellence. And there's a, a, a lot to be learned from excellence. Uh, I mean, a legacy, that's a big word. Uh, when I think about my work as a museum director, I think of myself as a conductor of an orchestra. We have extremely smart, talented curators, conservators, educators, public programming people, and trying to make some music together. Different things, powerful things. Uh, I often ask what's missing. I'm a feminist, so for a long time I used to go to the National Gallery, leave these anonymous notes and say, I don't see any women artists in the lobby. <laughs> Will that be changing anytime soon? <laughs> so we have to see where we're absent from and we have to ask to, to push that door open and, and again, think about uh, where is our story not being told? Again, as a gay woman, I look for the absence of, of, of my community too. So I, I, again, we've got great talent here at SAM. I, I know you know some of our terrific staff and some of them are here in the audience. And so it's really not my dream, it's making their dream come together and, and supporting their excellent work. And then the other thing that I think is important because museums are collections of collections. These are the national collections of America. We need to make them as broad and inclusive as, po as possible. And I, I mean that from folk art, self-taught art, photography, time-based media, Asian American art, all of this is American art and museums, again, were slow to even accept photography. It took like the 70s until museums thought like, hey, photography could be an art form. And, and again, you know, listening to these terrific speakers, fashion, material culture, all these things are part of creativity, design, and we need to make more space for all that too. And I'm going to implore you to do me two, do me two favors. Maybe you do this already. So one, buy art. Without buying art, there are no artists, there are no galleries. And here's the secret, lay away. I have never paid for a work of art with one check. I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Um, first of all, I don't ask for a discount because I'm in the museum sector, so I, I don't get that discount, but you, you, can, you guys can give a discount. Uh, it's layaway. It's just, they will actually let you take the work of art home with that first check, and then you just keep paying again and again over time. That is the secret. Okay. <laughs> uh, sh sh uh, we yeah, offer a payment conditions. plan, but you take it when it's paid in full. <laughs> Uh, 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 that's the correct way to do it, obviously. Uh, maybe people just know where I live. Um, so by art, it's really important. Look, we should live with beauty. We need to support others. We need to give, uh, and especially in your own family. I mean, think about the Van Gogh family. They really missed out. They did not support him uh, by buying art. And then second, and I can see that already, uh, these are shared values we have, and we need to pass them on to the next generation. Bring a child, preferably your own, to a museum and tell them why you love art, why you see yourself, why these stories are important to you because that is the future for us all as a country because it is art, I believe, that will bring us together in a time where we need to be together and we need to be strong and we need to remember what makes us great as Americans and it is American art and creativity and innovation. So. So, how about you join us for tea? Let's continue the conversation. Grab some of these extraordinary people. Ask them that one question that you were maybe a little shy to ask or we didn't get to today. Thank you for coming and come back again often, please. Thank you.
Thank you, Valerie, Gloria, Willie, Jendel.